Good evening and good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are joining us from around the world. Before I begin, I want to name that I am mindful that we have folks joining us from all over the world. The Church of the Larger Fellowship is a worldwide faith community. In my homily this today, I will highlight aspects of the United States political climate that intersects and in some ways mirrors some of the tensions that exist in Unitarian Universalism as well. The fact is that US politics has always impacted events all over the globe for positive and negative. In 2008, Barack Obama gave a speech in New Hampshire after losing the primary to Hillary Clinton that I have gone back to over and over in my mind. One of the reasons I thought about it, about that speech in particular, is how it highlighted for me the potential of who we could be in the United States. Here is an excerpt. We know that the battle ahead will be long, but always remember that no matter what obstacles stand in our way, nothing can stand in the way of the power of millions of voices calling for change. We have been told we cannot do this by a chorus of cynics and they will only grow louder and more dissident in the weeks and months to come. We've been asked to pause for a reality check. We've been warned against offering the people of this nation false hope. But in the unlikely story that is America, there has never been anything false about hope. This was the losing speech of Barack Obama, who of course went on to become the President of the United States. America, the United States, is an unlikely story. I've gone back over that line and applied it to Unitarian Universalism, the unlikely story that is Unitarian Universalism, a faith that aspires to be truly pluralist and one that dares to affirm the humanity of all and dares to center liberation, equity, and love without centering our way as the only way. This is more revolutionary than people realize, and our faith is inextricably tied to the history of this nation. Before 1961, Unitarians and Universalists were two separate faiths, and in 1961, the two merged, just when the civil rights movement was about to take center stage in the United States. And the Unitarian Universalists have had a mixed history with our response. Yes, Viola Liuzzo and the Reverend James Reeb died as a result of answering the call to support the March in Selma. And what many don't know, or maybe have never learned, is that how many congregations in the North were in fact upset and unsupportive of their ministers wanting to answer the call of the Reverend Dr. King and the coalition, coalition of the Southern civil rights leaders. There were many white UUs who resisted and did not think the way those were fighting for liberation was the right way. Keep in mind that Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King's letter from a Birmingham jail was written for white liberals, those who felt the need to try and manage how and when progress for descendants of enslaved Africans would happen. Unitarian Universals continue to grapple with how to truly center liberation and to do so unapologetically. When UU faith leaders center liberation and speak openly about dismantling white supremacy and centering the vo voices of those with target identities, we are sometimes met with the idea that we need to be centrist or moderate. I am very clear that I refuse to be halfway to a Nazi or white nationalists, or those that would deny the humanity of black people, indigenous people, immigrant, trans people, women, and those who do not hold institutional power. I am not halfway to that. The tensions and racial violence that have existed and plagued this country since 1492 continue to this day, in large part because of the resistance 
of mostly white people to be clear and truthful about the past and the desire to create an alternate reality where a meritocracy is real and where there is such a thing as bootstraps that someone is supposed to pull themselves up by. We don't talk enough about the monopoly of inherited wealth who has, and who has been allowed to own land and inherit that wealth. There is, there is a significant portion of this country that believes that they are only one good job away from becoming a millionaire, and that is a fallacy. Instead of working together with those with target identities to create a more equitable and sustainable society, those who believe the fallacy of the meritocracy would rather believe a known liar and false narratives about a stolen election rather than the fact that the poor and oppressed have always been criminalized in this country, not supported. This brings me to the events of January 6th and the inauguration and Amanda Gorman and one of the most beautiful poems I have ever heard spoken aloud. Amanda Gorman, the 21-year-old Black woman who was, is the youngest poet laureate and the youngest poet laureate to read a poem at the at a presidential inauguration, was still writing her poem when supporters of the former president stormed the nation's capital in hopes of overturning the election results. She said in interviews that she stayed up late finishing the poem and the following excerpt reflects her thoughts. Quote, scripture tells us to envision that everyone shall sit under their own vine and fig tree and no one shall make them afraid. If we're to live up to our own time, then victory won't lie in the blade, but in all the bridges we've made. That is the promise to glade the hill we climb if only we dare. It's because America it's because being American is more than a pride we inherit. It's the past we step into and how we repair it. We've seen a force that would shatter our nation rather than share it, would destroy our country if it meant delaying democracy and this effort very nearly succeeded. But while democracy can be periodically delayed, it can never be permanently defeated. In this truth, in this faith, we trust for while we have our eyes on the future, history has its eyes on us. This part of the poem was her response to the events, naming the force that would prefer to shatter our nation rather than share. I want to name an uncomfortable truth that exists in Unitarian Universalism. There are those that would rather fight and argue with black and brown Unitarian Universalists and Unitarian Universalists who are trans, disabled and may hold one or more target identity rather than listen and seek to understand the ways that Unitarian Universalism can be enriched by the knowledge of how to more fully move into the potential of a liberatory faith, of a life affirming faith, of a connecting faith. There are those in Unitarian Universalism who would rather shatter it than share. What we are called to do, people of conscience, as Unitarian Universalists who do believe in a liberatory faith, in a faith that centers community and love, those of us who believe in the unlikely story that is Unitarian Universalism, we are called to display courage and fortitude consistently and firmly. To speak truth to power and be clear that people with privilege have not been oppressed just because they are challenged when espousing falsehoods. This is our call because in the unlikely story that is Unitarian Universalism, we have it in us to strengthen and move our faith to more fully embrace the radical notion that our global community can be more just and more equitable for all. May it be so. Amen, blessed be, and ashe.